grace alone. Grace is what we need. What is given to us is a free gift. And that's what keeps us going. So as we prepare for the opening prayer, let's join together in the words of the simple little chorus, Sanctuary. Only because she kept losing the other guy, and I 
gave her one that I had, and she liked it, so she kept track of that. But we have all of these things in here that are important. Here's some uh, stamps for the, for the grocery store. I need to give you those. The Redfield Grocery Store, so you can, I think it's silverware this time. Uh, Saver stamps. There's a library card, and there's a subway card, and there's a driver's license, and the bank card, and stuff like that. Important things that we all need to have, right? You carry stuff around with you? Something important? You probably don't yet. Yeah. You probably don't carry things with you all the time, do you? Yeah. You're a little small yet to do that, but you know the day will come, and there will be things that are important that you want to have with you. And it's nice when they're small enough that we can put them in our pockets, right? Or carry them in a purse. For the, those that carry a purse, I'm going to give you this back so I can, you don't accuse me of losing it. Uh, and so we have those things that are important to carry with us. Wallets, cell phones, keys, stuff like that, right? Got to have that stuff. It's part of life. But you know, there is something we can carry that we don't need to have pockets for it. We don't have to have a purse for it. We don't have to have any way of carrying it. We can carry God with us. God will go with us wherever we go. And you don't need to have a wallet to put God into or anything like that. He's just, he'll just go with you. He left, when he left the earth to go back into heaven, he said, I will be with you always. He didn't say some of the time. He didn't say when it was convenient. He didn't say when I wasn't busy with somebody else. God said, I'll be with you always. Isn't that a nice thing to know that wherever we go, whatever we do, even if we don't have pockets, God's with us. And he said, he'll never leave us. He'll never forsake us. He'll always go with us. That's a nice thing to know. And it's a lot easier to carry God around than to keep a wallet or keys or carry a purse or all of that stuff. Easy to forget. But we can't forget to take God because God just goes on. Nice everyday carry. That's right. Thank you, God, for always going with us, for never leaving us alone, never leaving us to our own, our own ways and devices. Thank you for always going along. We thank you that that is such a blessing to us. Help us to always remember that you're with us. When I get some candy for our shy friend here, he's got candy. Good cheer. Look at that. I'm excited. <laughs> Thank you.
Sometimes it isn't the main teaching that he wants to lift up, but he always is reminding us that we don't need any more than Christ and him crucified. We don't need anything more than, than what Christ has done for us already. So today I, I want to look at the, the law and, and grace. The law divides us, but grace unites. So what does that actually mean? What are we talking about when we talk about the law? Well, the Ten Commandments, basically. I mean, when the people of Israel came up out of Egypt and into the desert, they had nothing to guide them. They had been slaves for 400 and some years. They, they didn't know how to rule themselves. They didn't know how to take care of themselves. And so God gave them ten basic rules of life. Here are the things that you need to do to be a society of people, to live together. Ten laws, ten words, as the Greek or as the Hebrew language calls them, the ten words of God. And, you know, we I've gone through this with confirmation classes year after year after year to, to kind of go through the Ten Commandments. And Jesus, you know, in the New Testament even defines it closer. He said, you only need two, love God and love your neighbor. And if you do that, the, the other ten will be taken care of. But the people of Israel found that it was really hard to keep the Ten Commandments. Big surprise, right? Hard to keep those Ten Commandments. And so, what did they do? Did they do like Jesus did and narrow it down? No. They expanded it. It's hard to keep ten. Let's make it. I have 600 rules and laws. And, and really, if, if you read the Old Testament, they have Genesis and then Exodus as the people are leaving, and we get the story of the, the Exodus out of, out of Egypt. And then we go into Leviticus, where they get all the rules and the laws. And that was a lot of them, but as time went along, they kept adding and adding and adding and adding to the laws that were meant to be kept. You need to keep these laws in order to be in a right relationship with God, and that translated to them, you need to keep these laws to earn your salvation. And that was, that's where the problem comes in. Because Paul, who was by all accounts, an expert in the law. He was a Pharisee. And the Pharisees were well known as a sect for trying to keep every law completely. So if you're going to keep every law completely, you need to be an expert in the law. And what he realized is, I'm a Pharisee. I have lived my life up to the point where Christ knocked me down on the road to Damascus. I've lived my life trying to live by the laws of the people of Israel, not the Jewish people. I tried to live my life by living all of those laws, and I found I couldn't. I couldn't do it. I could not keep all of the laws. So there was no hope. My salvation was not going to happen because I couldn't keep the law. As a matter of fact, um, it says in here that, that the law doesn't bless people, Oop, knocking things down, it curses people, because in, in uh, the second half of, well, in verse 10, in that same chapter, it says, all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse, as it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything that is written in the book of the law. Paul didn't see this fallacy before Christ came to him, 
because he didn't know there was any other possible way of doing it. He, he kind of thought, forgot about what happened before Moses and before the law. But it says, cursed is he who does not do everything. Not just most of the things, not just 70% or 80%, but everything. Now at the time that Paul was a Pharisee, there, there were over 700 laws that you had to keep. And there were laws about everything. There were laws about how far you could walk on the Sabbath, what constituted work on the Sabbath, and what was not work, what, what things you could do that weren't work, and laws about everything you can imagine. And just imagine trying to keep all of the laws and never, ever, not ever, make a mistake. Cursed is he who does not keep every law. Paul, as he pondered all of this after Christ came to him and Christ showed him the gospel, went way back. He said, okay, the law is there, but what happened before the law? What about Father Abraham? You know, kids love to sing that song. Father Abraham had many children and they wave and dance and jump around and all that kind of stuff. What happened between Abraham and Moses? Well, Abraham, it says, believed in God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Abraham didn't have the law. There was no law. There was no Ten Commandments. There was no you know, Hebraic laws, there were no Jewish, there were no laws. There were laws of the country, you know, whichever country you lived in, the king made laws, you had to obey those, but there was no law of God. And so Abraham, Abraham just believed. When God said, go into this new place that I'll tell you, Abraham packed up his stuff and his family and off they went. There wasn't any law that said if you don't do what God says, then you're cursed or anything like that. He just believed. So Paul looks at this and he says, well, okay, we've got, we've got the law, we've got the Ten Commandments. We have all of these people that are working to try to earn their salvation through the law. But we've got Father Abraham, the father of our entire tribe, the father of, of the followers of God in the world, who didn't have any law. He didn't have things he needed to do other than listen to God and do what God asked him to do, to just obey, to trust in God. And he said, what, who's, who's right? He looks at what Abraham was told, and it, uh, I didn't, I didn't list, it listed in here, but um, he says, in the, in the promises that were spoken to Abraham and to his seed, this was the promise that was given to Abraham and his seed, that you will be a great nation and many people will come from you. He said to your seed, to one person, and in Paul's mind, and I, I believe he's right, that one person was Jesus Christ. Until Christ came, the law kept us in line, kept us organized, kept us doing the right things. But through Abraham and his seed, through Jesus Christ, the seed of Abraham, we would be relieved from the law, from the works of the law. Now, we always have to be careful because people take that and they say, well, it, that means I don't need to do anything, right? I can just live my life and, and be a happy camper and do whatever I want to do because that's not going to save me. I'll just believe in God. I like John Wesley's quote, no one is a real Christian who does, does not do good works. Yet our own works have no part in meriting or purchasing our justification. That's the 
that's sort of the dilemma in, in Christian people. We, we have all of these folks who say, well, I don't need to do anything. And that's true. In order to be saved, you don't need to do anything. But if you follow Christ, if you really have accepted Christ and what he did and who he was, then you can't help yourself but to do good things, to do good works. Now, James says, you know, I don't believe your faith if I don't see the fruit of your faith. I think John Wesley would agree with you. You know, it isn't the works that save us. It's the works that show that we do have the faith that we say we have. You know, it's, we just can't help it. If we really have Christ in our life, if we've really accepted his gift and his, his sacrifice for us, how can we not help his people? How can we not reach out to those around us that have need, that have issues in their life that need to be dealt with and need to be helped? So we need to be careful because we can't let the laws and the works become how we do it to get salvation. We can't stop doing them either. They're an important part of each other. We have a free gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. Really, if we've accepted that gift truly, Jesus lives in our hearts. We're going to do good things. It's just how it is. It doesn't mean we'll always do good things, but you know, we'll try. Give it our best shot. Try to be the good, the good person, the best that we can be. So we have the law, which can't save us. This is the, the issue that Paul is dealing with all throughout this book of Galatians. And as I said, in almost every letter he writes, there's a little bit of law versus uh, gospel. But I'm looking at grace. It comes from the Greek word karas, karas, and it signifies God's unmerited favor that's freely bestowed on us as a result of his atoning sacrifice. And there's nothing we can do to make us worthy of it. I, I like the little acrostic they use. Grace is gift received at Christ's expense. A gift. And, you know, there, there are others that say a good God, goods received, or something, but a gift is an important way to look at it. You know, I know a lot in this day and age, we get gifts because somebody else gave a gift, and then we have to give a gift back. And we, we sort of are expected to give a gift, but I know everyone has received a gift that they didn't expect. Something that just kind of, seriously, you got me a gift? Why, you didn't need to do that. Why did you do that? Because I wanted to, because I felt like it, you know. A gift received at God at Christ's expense is what grace is. Grace is given to us as a gift. There is nothing that we can do to be worthy of God's grace. I, I, I remember, you know, Amazing Grace, the writer of that said that, you know, that he was, he thought that the biggest surprise would be when he got to heaven, to, would be to see who was there. And he said, and the second biggest surprise was all the people that were there seeing that I made it. Because none of us can earn the gift of God's grace. That's why he wrote the song, Amazing Grace. It just blew him away that God would love him that much, that he would give him that gift. Well, that's the gift that Christ gives to all of us, is the gift of God's grace. A gift that we can't earn, a gift that we can't possibly do anything to deserve. And so we go back to the to the basic premise of this whole series. Jesus plus nothing is what the gospel is all about. It's not about Jesus and going to church. It's not about Jesus and tithing. It's not about Jesus and going to Sunday school. It's, it's not about Jesus and supporting the, um, the Salvation Army or the Red Cross or any other charitable organization you can think of. Not that any of those are things you shouldn't do. 
Those are the things we do not to gain the gospel, but because of the gospel. We have this love that Jesus gives us, and there's nothing we can add to it, but we can always share it. And that's where we need to we need to be sure that we don't just hold on to it. You know, the gift of God's grace is one of those amazing things that when we share it, it doesn't diminish what we have. Now, Hazel and I sing a song, love is something when you give it away. And, uh, and it, it's true. If we give that love away. We give away the love of Christ. And the crazy thing is, the more we give away, the more we have. That's how God's economy works. You can't outgive God. You can't outdo good things from God. God will always do better things than we'll ever do. But that doesn't mean we should not try. Not trying to outgive God, but just trying to let God's love live and flow through us. The gospel is Jesus plus nothing. And we need to remember that. There is there's nothing that we can bring to the cross. This is you know, from the Rock of Ages. Nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. You bring nothing. Seriously, the most gifted, talented person that ever lived is like that in God's sight. They're, they're nothing. In God's sight. None of us are. No matter how important we might think we are, how wonderfully gifted we think we are, whenever we come to God, we're as low as we can possibly be. And yet, and yet, God sent His Son to die for all of us. See, that's the really amazing thing about grace is that God would sacrifice a part of himself for those of us that have really nothing we can give to God, just ourselves. God doesn't want most of us. God wants all of us. Not just all of who we are, but all of us. Song. He's got the whole world in his hands. He does. He also loves the whole world and wants the whole world to come to him. And when we are recipients of that grace, when we let that grace live through us, when people see that grace living and growing in us, then we get a chance to be a part of God's wonderful gift of imparting grace world that's around us. The grace that only Christ can give from God. So our challenge is to remember nothing. Not, not that you shouldn't remember anything, but nothing. Nothing's the key word. There's nothing we can do. There's nothing we can bring. There's nothing we can add to Jesus to enhance the gospel just need Christ in our lives. We need to accept the gift that he has given us of his grace, his, his grace that gives us a pathway to heaven and an eternal home with God the Father. But there's nothing we can do other than accept. You know? Christ holds the gift up. Here it is. It's pretty packaged. It's all wrapped up nice and it looks beautiful and we need to take that gift, open it up, and enjoy the gift of grace that God has given us. A gift received at Christ's expense. Jesus paid it all, the old song says. He paid it all. And so as we remember, as we live our life, remember there is there's nothing we can add to grace. Grace that will give us free.
freedom from our sins. God's grace. The law divided people. It set the Gentiles and the, and the Jews against each other because the Gentiles didn't keep the law, so they weren't holy and pure like the Jewish people. In, in the laws, we see that men and women are seen as different, different statuses, and so the law divided that. The law divides. But grace brings us all back together and says, folks, it doesn't matter. Jew, Gentile, male, female, young, old, whatever the case may be, the only thing that you can have is God's grace. It's the only, the only hope any of us have. Not in the law, not in which part of the world we were born in, not the gender that we have, not any of that stuff. Nothing. Nothing but God's grace. Shown to us and given to us through His Son, Jesus Christ. Grace. Amen. Amen. And turn to a time to respond to God's Word as we lift up. Prayers. Uh, I've added one to our prayer list. A, a friend of mine and a co-pastor, not a co-pastor as in I served with him in the same church, but we served together in the United Methodist Church. And he is a pastor at, uh, at Valley City, North Dakota, at the Epworth United Methodist Church. Dean Zacherson uh, has been, he's in the Fargo Hospital now with uh, breathing problems tested positive for COVID. His wife also, she's at home recovering, but he is hospitalized. They think he's responding well to the treatments. So he should be fine and be out, but it's uh, not too far away. Challenging times. So, pray for Dave and his family. Uh, his wife and a daughter. Also lift up prayers for the families of those that have lost loved ones. We know that we've had many losses in our community and uh, affecting people in our community, not necessarily in the community, but that affect people. And, and just be in prayer for all of our folks that are hospitalized, that are in nursing homes, or in places where, unfortunately, it's harder and harder to visit them. Uh, I know that uh, the cards and the letters that people send really do buoy their spirits and give them hope and joy. Be with our doctors and our nurses, our firefighters, our law enforcement, our military as they're stationed around the world, and our world and country's leaders and church leaders. And uh, continue to pray for our fellowship and prayer group as they uh, meet together and lift up all of these and many other prayers as, uh, as they gather on a weekly basis to pray. But do we have others we want to lift up? Yeah. Uh, just a prayer and a reminder that Tuesday uh, is the two year anniversary of the Ronnie Brown. Uh, Casey went up to party with God. Well, we'll uh, join together in our, our prayer song, and then we will go to a time of personal prayer. I'll close that with uh, pastoral prayer and Lord's prayer together. Lord, listen to your children.
let's be in a time of personal prayer. Loving and gracious God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, thank you for your gift of grace, for the gift that we can never earn, deserve, or even hope to get, and yet you offer it freely to us. Help us, Lord, to accept that gift, to hold it, and, and to use it with joy, with rejoicing, and to share it anyone who needs to know God's grace. Help us to be truly your, your hands as we offer that grace and love that only you can give to those who have need of it most. We do lift up a prayer today for all of our folks that are struggling with ill health. So many hospitalized, so many recovering at home, so many that are not, not feeling good. Even if it's a minor ailment, it's taken away some of the joy of their life. And we pray for healing for all who suffer with any kind of ailments. Especially lift up a prayer for uh, my brother in Christ, Dane, as he is dealing with the COVID-19 virus. We pray for his healing, for his wife's continued healing, and for for them to be able to be together again just as soon as possible. Well, thank you also for uh, all the people in the hospitals and the nursing homes that take care of not just those that deal with the COVID problems, but with other ailments and illnesses. Thank you for those doctors, nurses, aides, and all the hospital staff, and the cleaners and the, and the people that prepare the meals to the ones that make sure all the eyes are dotted and the T's are crossed on all the forms that need to be filled out. Thank you, Lord, for all the work to make life easier. We also lift up a prayer for those that are dealing with loss in these days. We have many in our, our congregation and many in our community that have suffered loss in the past several weeks and months. And we also remember that coming this week is the anniversary of two years since the death of Casey. Lord, we would pray for strength and courage for his family and for his friends as they continue to figure out life after he's gone. We know, Lord, that he has been blessed to be with you. We also lift up a prayer for all of those that are dealing with mental health problems in their lives, for those that try to help, for all that are hospitalized anywhere may or may not know about The ambulance drivers and the firefighters, the EMTs, the policemen, the patrolmen, the sheriffs and their deputies. And also for all, all who work in the military and who serve our country in order to keep us safe and secure. We give you thanks for all of them. We ask that you would lift your eyes upon all that we have lifted up this day. See them with your love and grace. Surround them with your arms of comfort. And give them the peace that only you can give. The peace that the world cannot understand. Because it is your peace. God's peace. All of these things we ask and we pray in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us to lift prayers to you with these words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. would like to take time to uh, bless the offerings that we have received, and I uh, would just say that if, uh, if you want to test out the electronic giving on our website, 
there is a giving button that you can use. And it will take you to a secure site to put in the information that needs to go in. And you will be able to give them that way. It is on the uh, HitchcockUMC.com website. And it's pretty painless. Ray and I have both checked it out. We're going to have a few other folks check it out before we give the whole big uh, rollout. But if you're interested, you can test it out there and see how it works. It's easy if I can do it. So let's offer a blessing over the offerings we have received for this worship and for others. Gracious God, we just thank you that you bless us with the ability to return to you just a portion, a portion of what you have given to us so that your work might continue through our church and through the missions and the programs that we help support. Lord, we thank you for the generosity of the people that can give and share. Thank you, Lord, for that gift. I pray that in Jesus' name today. Amen. And amen. <coughs> worry about that, but I've had that cough for years, so it's not, it's not COVID related, I have it on a regular basis. Well, as we close our time together, I, I'm going to, we're going to do just an old, an old familiar song, an old camp meeting song, I've decided to follow Jesus. We're going to do the three verses, and then we'll go back and do the first verse again, just so I don't confuse everybody. So if you're able, stand with me, and we'll sing it together as we close our time. Go with you this day and every day.